And then February 28th, Brad Jones, um, who's retired from the Secret Service, is going to talk about that experience and a little bit of that background with Secret Service history. Um, history After Hours in February will be February 16th at 5.30. Again, this is extra programming for those who want to come out in the evening. And we'll have Dr. Andrew Worman, who will talk about, he just published a book called Confusion of Liberty, which looks at the role of small talk <coughs> in the American Revolution. It's a very fascinating subject, too. Um, so you can see February is going to be chock full of really great programming, so I hope you're able to come to all of those different things. Um, on the back table, I've laid out calendars and um, a flyer at, for Celine, since that was extra and not on the calendar. And if you're not on our membership list so that this just comes directly to I put the membership info back there too, so think about becoming a member as well, and then you won't have to count on me remembering my list, and you will just know. All right? Sounds good? All right. So, today I'm really excited to have Catherine, Dr. Catherine Ellison with us, um, because she's now on our staff. So, I get to hang out with Catherine on a daily basis, and I know this is going to be very informative and interesting. Um, she got her PhD. In, uh, uh, with uh, emphasis on modern U.S. politics from Western Michigan. Um, some of you may know her as director of the OLLI program. Um, so she has been a part of our community for uh, quite a while, um, sharing her expertise. And so we're really excited to have her as part of our Castle Museum staff now. And I'm going to let you take it away and talk okay. about Saginaw in World War II, but welcome. Sounds Thank good. You. Thank you. Well, it is nice to see everybody today, and thank you for coming. It's been a while since I've been in front of a group, so if I talk too fast or too quiet, just yell at me. No, no laugh? That wasn't even, <laughs> not even a chuckle? Okay. <laughs> well, today I want to talk a little bit about some industries in Saginaw during the Second World War um, that converted to produce wartime goods. Um, I'm just going to talk about a few. There's lots of, of companies that do this. Uh, and there's lots of small industries that do this as well. Because what we'll see is after the beginning of the war, war contracts go to big business. And the little guy complained about that. They said, there's nothing for us. What are we supposed to do? So they ended up piecemealing out some contracts to smaller, smaller companies. I'm going to talk about some fairly large companies today, companies that make uh, big, big products and big parts for the war effort. So first of all, a little bit about where we're headed today in our talk. I'm going to talk a little bit about going to war and defense contracts because you kind of need a little bit of background on how we get to these companies starting to produce war goods when previously they produced something else. Uh, then we will talk about some Saginaw industries in the war, a little bit about reconversion and what came out of that, and we'll wrap it all up. So first of all, going to war. When did we get involved in World War II? Who knows? December 7th, which year? 1941. Close. It was December 8th, technically, but right after Pearl Harbor, right? So that is when we finally are officially in the war. That's when the US is going to participate. It's going on years before that, right? In Europe in 1939, Asia in 1937, it begins. So we're kind of late to the party. But that doesn't mean we were just sitting back waiting for something like Pearl Harbor to happen. Right? There's kind of a process. We're gearing up for war, um, but a little bit sort of on the down low. What else was going on in the US during the 1930s that maybe was a bigger priority? The Great Depression. right? Now, a war, believe it or not, will be good for the Great Depression because suddenly there's going to be a mass uptick in employment and production of goods. and our economy will rebound. But people are struggling, right? They certainly don't want to hear about this big war coming up, right? They're, they're worried about their own lives. So we have to be a little careful in how we, we go about this. So it's going to take some time. So first, I have a quote here from Franklin Roosevelt. Uh, there in my picture with all his microphone. We must be the great arsenal of democracy. For us, this is an emergency as serious as war itself. We must apply ourselves to our task with the same resolution, the same sense of urgency, 
the same spirit of patriotism and sacrifice as we would show were we at war. And he says this in December of 1940, right? A full year before we're actually involved in the war. So he's already talking about producing those war goods a year early. Who are we producing them for and how does this work? So war production is very slow. It doesn't happen overnight. It doesn't happen on December 8th. We decided we're going to go to war. Uh, it takes years to get there. So 1933, FDR and his New Deal create the Public Works Administration, or the PWA. If you know anything about FDR, you know he loved all those acronyms for all of his <laughs> groups that he created, right? So this is the PWA. And they create just that, Public Works. Things like bridges, post offices, um, anything you could imagine that they might need to, to fix. The road structure, Public Works is in charge of. But they also are kind of the first group we see producing war goods. 1933, what war were they pre preparing for? World War II. What's important about 1933 in Germany? Hitler, right? Hitler comes to power in January of 1933, legitimately. But Hitler is like a pretty sketchy guy. <laughs> We know there's going to be problems, right? And FDR isn't just going to sit back and wait for this. He's going to say, we've got to do something right away. So underneath the PWA, they're going to fund things like destroyers for the Navy, warships, things that had gotten out of date in the interim between World War I and World War II are going to start to be produced, right? New models, right? Things that we're going to need for this impending war. Uh, FDR is a pretty... Uh, Pretty good guy when it comes to foresight and seeing what's going to happen. Um, he has a very like global picture of the world, um, which is, believe it or not, unique for that time frame. Uh, and he realizes it's probably a matter of time only before we're involved in this. So what can we do without actively going to war to sort of get ready? So the PWA is that first step, 1933, early on, uh, to kind of prepare for combating Hitler. Now FDR has to wait. He's not inaugurated in January. He's inaugurated in March, the last time we had a March inauguration, 1933. Um, so he can see it come in, and he's anxious to get going. So September 1st, 1939, a few years later, we've been producing some, some new ships in the process, the new aircraft carriers under the PWA. Um, but what's important about September 1st of 39? <coughs> The invasion of Poland, right? You guys didn't know there'd be a quiz involved in this, did you? <laughs> the brushed up before you got here. You're right, the invasion of Poland, right? And this is a big turning point in World War II, a big concern. Hitler could easily have won this war, right, if the U.S. doesn't eventually get involved. Um, certainly England is struggling. Winston Churchill is, like, desperately begging for U.S. intervention. And we're slow. Again, we're late to this party to get involved in the war. So 1939, we passed the last of our neutrality acts. You might say neutrality, it's wartime. What are we doing? <laughs> well, again, we're kind of sitting back, waiting for our moment to get involved in the war. So the last of the neutrality acts is important because it actually does something that's sort of a push toward war, even though it says neutrality. It includes a cash and carry policy with a little bit of a difference from previous, previous policies. So cash and carry meant that belligerent countries could buy goods manufactured in the U.S., but they had to pay for them up front in cash. They had to carry them back on their own ships. That We would not send our, our ships to be a part of that war that wasn't our war, right? Um, but this changes because it suddenly allows like a free-for-all. Like anybody can do this. The idea is it's really benefiting those countries closer to us, like England. Right? This is going to be one of our allies. But cash and carry is kind of embedded in that neutrality act, the final one that passes. All through the 20s, early 30s, we are a very neutral country. And that's a very political thing, right? We saw World War I. We didn't like it. We wanted to, to take a step back and say, we're over here. We're isolated. We're
I'll try to. All right, I'm back. <laughs> I'm back. Let's see here. Well, now I forgot where I was. We got to start all over again. <laughs> 1941. That's what we made it to, right? No, so a lot of these uh, auto manufacturers, as I was talking about, a lot of them that were going to start producing war goods, these are big companies, right? All those little guys that produced vehicles, I mean, we had a gazillion of them prior to the Great Depression that produced, you know, a few cars a year all over the country. Gone. <laughs> the Great Depression ended those companies. So we are really left with a lot of these big manufacturers that have managed to, to eke out an existence for those years and still be around. They're going to take this on. And then as smaller businesses come back or kind of come out of hiding after that depression, like I said, they're going to want a piece of the pie too. So Stinson knows businesses are here to make money too. We can't deny that. So a little bit about defense contracts. So this is how you go about making war parts in some regard, or munitions. Uh, is you need a contract from the government to tell you, produce this many, whatever. So after Pearl Harbor, the War Production Board, or we had that War Resource Board before, uh, so this is kind of the active version of it, you could say, uh, takes over, right? And they're in charge of all domestic manufacture of war goods. So they're kind of like the overseers, the top level, right? Making sure that all these companies are making what we need, that we're getting feedback from the Army and the Navy ordinance groups, and they're going to tell us what we need, and we're going to make sure they're being produced, right? So there's no of stumbling in this war. So they do end up limiting raw materials based on use. Um, I had a friend that was interested in the National Washboard Company, uh, to be interested in, but <laughs> he was. Uh, and he wanted to know, he's like, you know, well, during the war, like, what happened to them? He's like, I've never seen one from, from this time frame. Well, they couldn't get the metal for their washboards because they weren't producing those war goods. So they ended up taking them out of glass, right? They had to change their materials. And I would imagine a glass washboard probably doesn't stick around as long as a metal one. <laughs> Just my thought. So probably why you haven't seen too many from that time frame. Uh, by February, they will shut down some industries completely. You can't get metal. You can't get whatever you need. You're going to have to shut down. There was no other way about it. And by February 1st, complete conversion was required. For those businesses that were going to convert and produce war goods, they had to do it by then. So places like Steering Gear, which we'll talk about, um, they will completely convert by February 1st, 1942. But before that, they're actually making you know, guns on one line and car parts on another. They're making both at the same time. It's not very efficient. right? So it's kind of a problem for places like that. Uh, conversion wasn't easy, though, either. Because suddenly it's like, well, <laughs> suddenly we've got to stop making this, and we've got to make sure we have all the, the machines to produce these other parts and make sure that that's up and running by a government deadline, mind you. Um, but they manage to do it. Companies get on board. They want those defense contracts. They want that money that comes with a defense contract, right? Good money guaranteed from the government, right, which is better than you can say for most buyers. And I mentioned the Army and Navy Ordnance Department. So the Ordnance Departments were kind of in charge of maintenance on things like you know, vehicles, um, guns, that kind of thing. Um, so they kind of better knew what was needed. So they're helping to kind of filter this back to that, that war production board and make sure that what's coming is what they need. So what about Saginaw, Michigan? I'm good so far. <laughs> so a few were, and I'm not going to talk about all of them, I don't have all day, but a few of the big ones we'll talk about. So 1937, right, another important year. Uh, as early as 1937, the Army Ordnance Office out of Detroit visits Saginaw Steering Gear to inquire about something. They want to know if machine guns, which were then built by hand, piece by piece, could be mass produced. What do you think Steering Gear said? Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, we could definitely make that for you for, for a price, right? Um, so 1937 is an important year as far as the war goes. Anybody know why that's important? What changes in 37? In Germany, I'll give you a hint. No? 
So in 1937, this is when the Nazi party, Hitler's group there, starts rounding up non-political prisoners in concentration camps. Many of them Jewish, right? So this is of some concern. It's not just political now. There is clearly a bigger, bigger plan at play here. Um, so this is why the inquiry. Again, oh, we don't like this guy. War is coming. Can we make these weapons? Yes, we could. So Saginaw Steering Gear, our first company we'll talk about here. Uh, June 15th, 1940, Steering Gear accepted an educational order uh, from the War Department to produce the equipment necessary for a 30 caliber tank machine gun in quantity. So this was kind of like, could you get the things to make this? And in what kind of time frame are we talking? Um, so again, this is kind of like research. This is kind of questioning, like, could it happen? What's the time frame? How many do you think you could produce once you have this equipment? Uh, at what rate of speed? So there's a study done. Uh, GM accepts the contract from the government, and steering gear starts to produce guns, essentially. And they'll produce a few different kinds. And ignore my thing on the bottom. I forgot to delete. <laughs> So there's a new plant built by Steering Gear, um, dedicated April 22nd, 1941, dubbed the Gun Plant. Right? And this is to focus on that war production. Now, in September of 1940, before Pearl Harbor, obviously, uh, we have a peacetime draft that begins. Right? Last peacetime draft in history. And it took a lot of Saginaw's young men in this draft to prepare for this inevitable war. So steering gear says, what are we going to do? We need workers. And they had women, of course, that would work there. Um, but they also decided, well, let's move some of these machines into classrooms, shop classes. So at least when we're trying to hire people, they've seen <laughs> what they would be using in this job. Uh, and it turns out beneficial because a lot of people are feel more comfortable with it. They've seen it, women and men that weren't drafted. And they can take jobs at steering gear. So it's kind of a clever, clever thing for them to do, I thought. So a little bit about the guns they produced, a couple of them here. Uh, the model 1919 A4 machine gun, you can see in my picture there, uh, began production in 1940, again before we're in the war. And they produced about 365,000 and change. A lot of guns, but it's going to be a pretty considerable war. Uh, they will also start producing the M1 carbine rifle. Uh, 1943, and this is short, it's lightweight, uh, semi-automatic, again 30 caliber, and it's made to be used in the Pacific where you had to carry stuff around and you couldn't you know, go back to base easily, so it was lightweight, it's kind of made for that purpose and it worked great, apparently. Uh, they produced you know, 294,000 inch of those in Saginaw. So again, a lot of guns, <laughs> um, but they are going to be put to use, are being put to use by 43. And there's such high demand for these guns <clears throat> that they're trying to find like a cheaper and easier way to produce them. Uh, and the government's like, how can you do it faster, better, cheaper? Um, so they end up turning to Malleable Iron, another Saginaw group there. Again, part of that GM outfit. Um, and they end up using something called Armistiel. What's Armistiel, Saginaw people? Do you know? I'm going to tell you, but I thought maybe there's somebody here that knew about this or worked there at one point in time. Who knows? So Armasteel is like a prolytic cast iron, which is basically meaningless to me. But <laughs> apparently what you could do is you could, you know, form it about the size of whatever part you're making. So there's much less waste once you went to produce that part. Uh, whereas, you know, steel had to be a huge, huge thing and there's a lot of waste and that's expensive. So this made it a little bit cheaper to do. Uh, it will save taxpayers millions of dollars, uh, as it turns out, on one gun alone, one gun's production alone, I should say. Uh, it could be cast to the contours of the finished product, less cooling time. So sounds good to me. It was a good, good idea there, I guess. So steering gear is producing guns. Uh, Wix machine tool, Wix Brothers, is also playing their part in the role here. 
in the war. Um, they're going to they make lathes for auto crankshafts used in an all-different car. Uh, Wick's important segments include lathes for automotives, tractors, diesel engines, special machinery. Let me just say machinery. Okay. And you can imagine that that would be important to a war. There's lots of war machinery that needs to be produced. Um, so Wix is going to kind of do the same thing, and they're going to convert. Uh, and some of their lathes are sent to steering gear for use in their gun production. Uh, and there's lots of that type of sharing going on as well. So they build uh, machinery, weapons, sea craft, land vehicles used in World War I and World War II. Um, and they will receive the M flag for outstanding achievement in the manufacture of marine boilers for merchant vessels and warships. Uh, the M stood for merit, by the way. Um, and the other thing I wanted to mention, steering gear, obviously there's different, uh, there's you know, one in Grand Rapids, there's one in Saginaw, and they're all connected. Well, when the war happens, they don't necessarily all make the same things. They might make you know, one part here, another part here, and then they trade, so they can produce an entire gun. Um, and they, they actually found that it was faster, the government did, than trying to provide and get that machinery in every factory was to sort of trade off. Who's making what? What do we need to produce the entire weapon or tank or plane or whatever it might be? So a lot of that trading goes on. Uh, and here, this is from the Saginaw News, thanks to, to Tom Trombley. Um, and they had a little comment in here about their service to the nation at WIC. Um, we can all be soldiers behind the line, which is just as essential to the war effort because our soldiers cannot fight without equipment. When this war started, there was much talk, too little and too late. And if we had continued to be too little and too late, we would have been defeated. We have not been defeated because men and women, like the employees of Wick's Boiler Company, realized this was a fight for survival and have played their part well in supplying the armed forces. So there is a great deal of pride to, to participate in this war in whatever way you can. A lot of these companies lose employees to the draft, to the war, and they end up having to fill those, those slots, but new workers really come through, right? And a lot of them kind of feel some pride in, in taking on this big master plan that we have to win the war. Right? It's all about victory. So the next company I want to talk a little about is Baker Perkins, um, which initially has two separate sort of routes that it takes in its production here in Saginaw. Um, the first one was food machinery. So things like big, big mixers for mixing up bread doughs and that kind of thing. Uh, and then also large mixers for the chemical industry. Right? You've got to mix up all those different compounds and chemicals. So they, they primarily make sort of this baking, mixing machinery. Again, a machine company, right? So large orders for uh, mixing equipment, not for bread necessarily. <laughs> but for smokeless powder, cordite, which is a smokeless explosive, are placed with Baker Perkins, right? How are we gonna mix this stuff up? We need some huge mixers. We need a company that makes mixers. That'll be useful for the war, right? So they're already producing these products that can be used, more than likely. Early 1941, horizontal boring mills are starting to be manufactured uh, by Baker Perkins as well. And Elmer Baker of Baker Perkins summed up Saginaw's task is the products of our factories are now fighting the battles that will engage our soldiers and airmen in 1943. It's very poetic, I thought. <laughs> right? we're, we're helping to fight these battles, essentially, by producing these products. So mixers are important, no doubt about it. <clears throat> They're also going to produce um, parts of destroyers, um, boats, parts of boats used in the war. It's not just about mixers, uh, but again, a company using sort of metal fabrication is going to produce something made of metal just for a different aspect, right? So there's an example of one of their giant mixers, in case you're wondering. That's not like a KitchenAid. That's a big, huge floor model mixer. Um, so Saginaw produced uh, founder castings for landing barge, propellers, air raid sirens, shell lathes, grinders, and other service equipment, together with a hull section for destroyers um, and specialized mixers or explosives and that kind of thing. So pretty, pretty interesting. Never would have considered that from a mixing company, I don't think. Uh, one of the things that helped make our Higgins boats 
which might look a little bit familiar because they're probably in like every picture of the D-Day landing that you've ever seen. Um, they use these uh, when they storm the beaches of Normandy um, and also in the Pacific quite a bit. Uh, on D-Day alone, there's an estimated 1,500 that are used. So a lot of boats. Parts of them, yeah, at Baker Perkins. Uh, they also produce a portable field bakery. You might not have considered that you are going to need to bake things and eat things out there in wartime. Um, so I have some pictures here, which, like, this is kind of the bakery portion and the oven portion, also portable with wheels, which is kind of interesting. Um, and they also receive an award from the Army and Navy for success in manufacturing all of these things needed for the war. Um, a lot of these companies are given accolades for helping support the war effort. And my last company to talk about is the Lufkin Rule Company, um, which you can go upstairs and see some, I think there's some Baker Perkins stuff up there too, and Lufkin Rule. Um, and they make tape measures and <laughs> rulers and things like that. And they went producing from all these things to munitions, weapon parts, Again, things for warfare, right? Uh, and they also receive an E this time for excellence instead of the M for merit for wartime production. Um, and you can see some advertising there and pictures of their measuring tapes. Look pretty similar to the tapes today. <laughs> no, no mystery there. Um, but they also go into this production and they do whatever they can. And a lot of companies have to kind of like tell the ordinance committees, tell the war production board like what they believe they can produce. Like we want a contract for this part that's going to go into tanks. We believe we can produce it in this time frame and this many, and then it might be accepted or not. So a lot of it is them thinking like, when we convert, what can we do? It's usually something similar, right? They're producing metal tapes, cloth tapes, all different things here. But they think we could convert and produce this in a similar fashion to what we were doing before the war, right? Because if it was something completely different, it would be very hard to convert to that industry, right? So, I mean, the government realizes this, and they want these companies to consider the fact, how can we kind of, like, ease them into this wartime production? Something that's similar to what they're already doing that isn't going to ruin their civilian industry either. Because in the first couple of years, they're usually doing both, right? So, reconversion, right? Back to the civilian world, right? The war is over. Hitler's dead, Japan is bombed, what do we do now? How do you go from producing parts for, for tanks and jeeps to measuring tapes again? Right? You might imagine just like getting there, it didn't exactly happen overnight. The thing is, once the war is over, the government money is over too. So companies had to get back to business to survive. Right? You had to start producing something you could sell to people um, that would make sense, that you could make money off of. <clears throat> So in late 1943 and early 1944, the U.S. manufactured almost as many munitions as all the allies and enemies combined. So that's a lot of reconversion that's going to need to happen. We're producing a lot of war goods. Um, we have a lot of factories here in the U.S. at that point. So factories that had government contracts were in a somewhat good place to reconvert um, to civilian manufacturing. A lot of times their equipment was updated, their factory space was updated because they had to produce these war goods, um, all with that government money. So they're like modernized, you could say, which is a good position to be in because some factories shut down for the duration of the war. They had nothing that they could produce. They couldn't get materials to produce it. People at home are not buying during the war, even though they're certainly making money. They shut down or they don't produce very much. So a lot of these bigger companies that got these war contracts end up spending money to, to make their company a little bit better, too. So in theory, it's a good place to be in. But there's probably some road bumps to reconversion as well, even for those groups. Uh, the first is unemployment. Big concern in 1945 when the war is over. Why are we so concerned about unemployment? Lots of people coming back with no jobs. Those people are unemployed. In 1933, our unemployment rate in the U.S. was 
So a lot of unemployed people. And that was the Depression, and that was something we did not want to return to. And there's kind of this fear that the war was like a temporary thing. Now that it's over, we're going to slide right back to where we were. We don't want that to happen. Uh, but in 1944, just as the war is about to end the next year, unemployment is at 1.2%. Right? Uh, and we will see full employment very shortly. But there is this concern that all these people coming back, no jobs, ends up, you know, a lot of women leave the workforce or get shoved out of the workforce, and men take those jobs. But, uh, you know, they might have been a little angry, some of them, for sure. But we, we weren't as concerned, you know, once we finally start to see how this is going to take place. And the problem is, honestly, 1945, most companies would prefer to hire men. So we can't, can't help it too much there. Um, inflation is another big concern, right? Okay, people have been saving and, and not spending and all these things for years during this war. Our price is going to be sky high. Uh, and part of the concern was that the government does regulate prices during the war. And there's some like lingering <laughs> price regulation for a few years. So there will be a little bit of a like dip those first, first couple years, 45 through about 47. Um, there's a little bit of a recession. Prices are a little wonky. But then it straightens itself right back out again. So some concerns for reconversion, but a lot of businesses take the risk. They want to do it. <clears throat> oh, and I mentioned the recession there in the early years. <clears throat> so in 1945, Americans are saving a lot. 21% of the yearly income they save. Why do you think that was? Depression, people are savers. <laughs> Nothing to buy. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the thing is, 1945, the war is over, yippee, everybody's returning home. You go down to the car lot to buy a car, and they got nothing. They haven't produced anything in four years. <laughs> what are you going to do with all this money? So that takes a minute, too. Um, but saving seemed important during the war, right? Don't buy unnecessary things, right? Leave it for the war effort, right? We need this. Um, reuse, recycle, all this stuff for the war. So it was kind of a natural inclination. And you're right, the Depression played into that, too. People were concerned. It happens again. <laughs> Am I going to need this, right? So I'm going to save it up. Um, in my little advertisement here, see that prices go no higher. Be a saver, not a buyer. Right? Which, which says it, right? Don't increase those costs. Save what you've got um, for someone else that needs it. So as buyers start to demand, like, hey, we'd like to buy that new car now, right? It's been a few years. We've saved our money. We want to buy an old mobile, I guess. They do reconvert to these civilian goods, right? But they have to get back the machinery that produces those parts, to say produce a vehicle, for example, um, and start producing it to get to the point where you're producing vehicles to sell, right? Enough to sell. Um, so it takes a minute, you know, but it does happen. Uh, industry is anxious to make money. So steering gear will go back to auto parts. Um, and they're hot to get into, like, uh, what do you call it? Power steering, <laughs> which they had said before the war, oh, this is a thing, we got to, they kind of forgot all about it. Well, now it's, it's back in a big way. Uh, Baker Perkins is going to return to their mixer industry primarily, for a few years anyways. Uh, and Lufkin returns to making tools. Right? And you almost could forget that they ever made anything else, right? Uh, but the military industrial complex is looming. So after World War II, you don't really get the luxury of just sitting back, relaxing, enjoying peacetime. Because now we've got a cold war to worry about, right? And even though it's cold, it means we're not really fighting anywhere, those, those hot spots, but we'll ignore that for now. We have to prepare for the Third World War, right? It could happen. So this kind of artificially creates this industrial sort of preparation for war, a war that doesn't actually occur. Um, but in many ways, this keeps industry uptick, keeps employment up. 
right? And it creates this sort of artificial prosperity, right, of the 1950s. So all of that is good for business. A little scary for Americans, I guess, <laughs> in the 1950s. Uh, but there is this rebound after the war, right? So that's kind of how you get from, you know, regular businesses, war contracts, warfare, to reconverting them back to, you know, daily business. And that was it. <laughs> in 26 minutes. <laughs> Do you have questions for me? Yes. Do you know the impact of women going to work in Saginaw, number one, mm -hmm. and what the impact of that was, how, how many? So I don't have any statistics offhand that I know. But most industries that employed factory work, hard work, right, was, was younger men, and they got drafted. Right. So they had to fill those necessary slots right. with women. And most, I mean, women too, not to say that I would be excited to like, you know, make parts somewhere, but I think women are excited to be a part of this war effort, right? They're excited to be patriotic. They're excited to make good wages. Um, and if you were a company that took a war contract from the government, you didn't have a choice. You had to employ any able-bodied citizen. So black, women, whatever. So I don't have any numbers for you, but. The interesting part to me is I was born somewhere in World War I. So I was too young to know that immediate go to war thing. Mm -hmm. But my dad worked for Chevy Service Parts. I, to my knowledge, he was never out of a job. Now, he was too old to be drafted. Ah. But if, if General Motors shut down cars, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I mean most women I don't have a choice. They get forced to to leave those factory jobs. Not to say women don't work in the 50s. They certainly do. Um, but a lot of those jobs are returned to men. Um, and if men weren't drafted, chances are they stayed working in that industry even if it converted to some other production line. Yeah. Yeah. It is too, yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Uh, in the back, there's a question. Yeah. mentioned in the beginning, of course, there's this long buildup to, to war. And you have to convince all of these isolationists, these neutral-minded people, that this is the right choice, right? So for instance, to get women kind of on board, right? We have all these scrap drives and save your lipstick tubes for the scrap drives. And, and a lot of that stuff 
doesn't get reused, or there's not enough of it to get reused. But it's meant to make people participate, right? This war is our war, right? What are we doing to help? Uh, and employment's kind of the same thing, right? Like we need workers. Who can we get? Women can do it, right? And you get women to work in those industries. Yeah. Were there similar um, steps taken in the First World War in Canada? Did Yeah, so the government does take similar steps but a lot later, <laughs> and it's not quite as smooth. So they learn a lot from the First World War, and when they approach industries for the second round, they do it a lot earlier. They do all these research things ahead of time. Could we make this? You know, could it be produced here? Um, so it's more of a smooth transition. But yeah, similar. Do one more question in the back. No. No, I didn't find out about that one. Guide lamp. There you go. Everything was cheap in 1940. <laughs> A lot cheaper than today. <laughs> well, thank you everyone for today. I enjoyed talking to you. <laughs>